great pleasure to introduce Mark Stacey from Stacey's Auctioneers in Rayleigh. Mark came and spoke to us well, almost well, well, at least. You didn't see that one, but uh, it was. It was absolutely fascinating. And a bit of spice uh, this evening. Some fellows have brought items which Mark has going to kindly put an evaluation on. So, without further ado, Mark. Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, first of all, I'll test the volume. Everyone hear me okay? Yes, yes excellent. Let me know. I'll turn my volume up a little bit. Um, secondly, a very small introduction. Um, as already mentioned, yes, my name is Mark Stacey, and I am uh, an antiques auctioneer at Value by Trade. Um, just picking up on uh, John, John's point uh, when he stood up here, and I think he was... Uh, suggesting there might have been a few antiques amongst you this evening. Um, I'm, well, generally when I value an antique or I appraise an antique, I, I generally have to turn it upside down for these marks. So uh, I'm be pleased to know I won't be doing that this evening. Um, but carrying on from um, the introduction, uh, my family business, uh, which is now run by myself and my brother, conduct antique and collectible auction sales once a month. Um, our auction sales generally consist of anywhere between 12 to 1800 lots. Um, they will consist of furniture, silver, pictures, collectible items, or collectible items will be toys, cigarette cards, stamps, postcards. Uh, the list is quite endless. Um, I have uh, taken the liberty of bringing uh, along this evening um, my, some of my catalogues for my forthcoming sale. Um, so, just to get a little bit of promotion out of the way. Next auction sale is next Monday and Tuesday. We have a public viewing the Friday, Saturday and Sunday before. Uh, also, the lots we sell are very much available on, on the internet. So if you are a little bit intrigued or have a bit of interest within the antique uh, field, then please feel free, uh, please take away a complimentary catalogue. Now, um, the joy of my job, um, generally when I wake up in the morning, I don't know who I'm going to see, what I'm going to see. Um, and it is for me uh, what I class a bit of a charmed life. Um, one day I can go out and, and not see very much, and on occasions, on another occasion, I can find a little hidden gem, a little treasure somewhere. Just a couple of little um, tasters as far as gems which I found over the last sort of 12 to 18 months. Uh, one particular which stands out for me in, in quite a big magnitude way. Um, I was doing probate valuation close to my hometown of South End. Um, and I was doing a little evaluation where there were some postcards involved. Flicking through um, postcards, didn't see very much of any great interest. And the last page, there was a postcard of with a, which was made of silk, made in France, uh, I would have said probably sort of 1900, 1910. Um, but on this occasion, um, it had quite a nice image of Titanic upon it. Um, now, generally, when I look at postcards, I would generally look at the front, but obviously having such a, a nice uh, image on, I had to turn to the back. The back, a very brief description, um, saying, Dear Jane, I'm now um, going aboard Titanic. Um, I'm looking forward to my new life uh, in New York. And this was signed uh, by uh, a gentleman who posted the postcard from Southampton to Southend-on-Sea. Um, to value such a piece, um, I don't have that specialist knowledge. Um, but I did speak to a, a very good specialist in Titanic memorabilia. Um, his indication was somewhere between twelve to fifteen thousand uh, pounds for uh, such a postcard. Um, the family still have it in their possession, and, and I'm pleased that it might be going into a museum next year. So it's something that's going to go on loan. It's never going to be sold, and just going to go on loan to a permanent loan to a museum. So that is one fantastic find, um, certainly over the last uh, last year. Um, another find, going back a few years ago, um, generally I do talks like this, uh, church groups, uh, uh, towns, uh, women guild, uh, maybe some WI groups. Um, on this occasion I was doing a, a little valuation for my local church in South End St Lawrence's, um, and a bit like this evening, uh, a few of the members have brought on some items to be valued, and there was one item which I left till the end. It was a tiny little pottery mouse. Um, it was uh, made uh, around about the 1890s, 1900, uh, in Lambeth by the Dalton factory, and it was uh, modelled by a gentleman called jo George Timworth, who is probably one of the best modellers for Dalton in the late 19th century. I asked the lady um, how she came by uh, the piece, because it was quite a rare piece, um, and she explained that she had collected mice uh, for many years, and she was walking around her local boot sale, um, and uh, there it was on the table. She didn't know exactly what it was, um, and, but she wanted a little bit of a barter. The gentleman wanted a pound for it. It 
was knocked down to 75 pence, and off she went away with it. So talking about the valuation uh, this particular evening, I said to her, what, what do you think it's worth? And she said, well, it is damaged, which I agreed with. Her expectations was probably somewhere between 40 to 60 pounds. Um, I had said to her, I think it has a bit more value than that. I think it might be fetched between four to 600 pounds. Um, within the next 24 hours, it was in our auction sale, ready to go under the hammer. Photographed a lot, and these days we do quite a lot of uh, internet bidding, um, and that's where quite a lot of our sales take place, not via um, people just coming to the auction sale, but generally up and down the country and abroad as well. Uh, the internet plays a very strong part when we uh, publicise any item for auction. The demand was very strong for this uh, George Tinworth pottery mouse. Uh, the bidding started off very quickly at £400, past £600, up to £700, £800, £900, £1,000, £11, £12, £12, £50. The hammer goes down. £1,250, a bargain at a boot sale for £75. <laughs> Amazing what people sell um, and what people find within... Um, boot sales, um, and it's generally, during the course of the year, you'll hear a, a little story like that. Um, and uh, just to finish off that story, um, the fact that the whole money, um, I know, went to Southend Breast Cancer Unit, the, the lady was very pleased with the result, and the whole lot went to Southend Breast Cancer Unit. So then that in itself, for me, was a fantastic story, and I have little other stories um, to tell you this evening. Now, other parts of my job, occasionally I do get involved uh, with a little bit of the media work. Um, these days, if you turn on the television, uh, you'll see generally during the uh, mid-morning programmes, the likes of Bargain Hunt, Cash in the Attic, Vlog It, just to name a few. Um, now, I do work occasionally on the Vlog It show. Now, there's always a confusion because there is another Mark Stacey that works on, on front of the camera. Um, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not the camp Mark Stacey. Um, <laughs> but um, he is a, a very good friend of mine. Um, he lives down in Brighton and uh, he's, uh, he's a very good friend. Now, with my job when I work uh, for the likes of Cash in the Attic, I used to work for Vlog It, etc. Um, I work as an off-screen consultant. So my job is to maybe do a script for the on-screen experts or to do a script for the actual show itself. Um, as far as Vlog It's concerned, I'm not sure if anyone watches the Vlog It show at all. There's a few people nodding. Um, but basically, it's a scenario where um, members of the public can come to a venue um, the items are valued, it goes into an auction sale and the estimate uh, is tested into the water to see um, if the experts are right with, with their estimate that they've been given. Um, my job is I have to cherry pick the items that go on front of camera, so I have to sort of look through sometimes the good, sometimes the bad, occasionally the ugly, um, to get to the bits that, that go on front of camera. Um, if I talk about goods, um, we can probably talk about uh, quite recently, about a year, 18 months ago, a rhinoceros libation cup, um, a Chinese libation cup, a medicine cup, uh, and it was a rhin made of rhinoceros horn, very desirable as far as the Chinese market is concerned. We actually, uh, as a Flog It show, we actually done a special program regarding this actual item because it sold for just over £60,000. The Chinese market at the moment, um, there's lots of markets that are very strong, but the Chinese market is one of the strongest. Uh, Chinese silver, ivory, porcelains, um, the Chinese just want their history back, so the market is very strong and very buoyant. I'm sure most people have um, caught the news about a year, 18 months ago, when a Chinese pot was discovered in the local uh, 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 auction room out in West Bryslip. Um, the auctioneer first valued the vase at £1,000-£1,500, then took a bit of advice on it and changed his estimate quite quickly to £800,000 to £1.2 million. Um, subsequently, via the auction sale, a world record price was set, uh, in which it made £54 million. Um, I'm sure um, most people have saw that in the press or actually the national, web, the national web television programmes as well. Downside to that, ladies and gentlemen, um, the vase still hasn't been paid for. Uh, the reason behind that um, is the fact that the uh, Chinese uh, are not letting uh, so much money go out of the country. So there is, I believe, I believe I was speaking to uh, one of the associates, I believe his deposit has been put down, but nowhere in excess of the 54 million as yet. So uh, interesting that this Chinese market is, is very strong uh, indeed at the moment. So that's certainly the good, the Chinese Libation Cup, something that we found up in Scotland about a year, 18 months ago. Good, bad, I always like to tell this one because it always remain, will remain in my memory forever. A lady came in with a leather suitcase, it was a very tatty suitcase, um, and uh, generally I, I, I've got a good gut feeling about most things. 
we lifted this old suitcase onto the table and I thought, oh, this is it, Some, something's good is going to come out of this suitcase. How wrong was I? I, I flipped the locks, the musty smell came out, a bit like perfume to me, the musty smell. Um, and uh, old newspaper, um, and uh, there was a dinner service. Flipped it upside down quite quickly, couldn't believe my eyes. The words quite clearly stated, microwave proof. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, for me, um, so, um, certainly the bad uh, when it comes to valuing a, 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 an antique when it's placed in front of you. Um, generally, I have to let people down quite lightly when I, when I value something. So generally, it's a uh, no commercial value, madam, and, uh, on, and on to the next client, please. Um, but still can't believe that one. Um, but I do have a lot, six or seven other colleagues who will back me up. That's a true story. Um, going on a bit further, I'd go good, bad, um, ugly. Um, I always find taxidermy quite um, ugly when it comes into sale, um, but there is quite a plenty of demand for pieces of taxidermy, whether it's a, a, a glass a glass domed a bow fronted cabinet with a fish in it, or something a little bit more unusual than that. Now, the unusual piece of taxidermy which I've had to handle, um, going back about eight years ago now, was a little kitten. Um, now. It was, in my uh, uh, in that sort of uh, train of thought, very macabre, something that you'd have probably seen at a Victorian freak show, 1880s, 1890s. You'd have probably paid in the Victorian times maybe a penny to go and see um, such an oddity. It was a double-headed kitten um, oh. under a glass dome. <laughs> now, um, my colleague uh, um, tapped me on the show and he said, Mark, what do you think of this? Um, and quite, uh, quite ugly, really. Um, what do I say? As an auctioneer, as a valuer, when we look at an object, we can say, well, we sold one last month and it made this, or it sold one last year and it made that. Never sold a double-headed kitten before. Um, so it was under a glass dome. I said to James, I said, well, the, the glass dome had to be worth 50 pounds or so. <laughs> Put it in at 50 to 100 pounds, it, it, it should sell for that. So into the auction sale it went with a pre-sale estimate of 50 to 100 pounds, um, not expecting much more. Bidding was reasonably brisk, it went up to 120, 140 pounds. Then there was two people at the back with their hands up, up to 300, 400 pounds. And then my colleague came on the phone, uh, yes sir, uh, then another bid taken off the telephone at 500 pounds, 550, 600 pounds, any advance, 650, new bidder, 700 pounds, 750, I'm thinking, this is a wind up, where's Jeremy <laughs> Someone's having me on here. Up to 800 pounds, 850, 900, 950, and uh, the hammer goes down at 1,000 pounds. Most ugliest piece that I've actually had to sell, ladies and gentlemen. But there is generally a market out there for ugly pieces, as in taxidermy. Um, so if you do have a double-headed kitten under your, uh, under your bed, in your loft, um, then please come and uh, feel free to come and see me. I'm sure I can get a reasonable price for you. Now, um, my um, sort of forte really much is, is porcelain. Um, I've been fortunate enough that I worked for several years uh, within the porcelain department at Bonhams uh, before coming back down to my family firm. Um, so for me, porcelain is very much uh, my passion. So um, I did bring uh, one piece of porcelain uh, along to show you this evening. Um, but I will also talk about the items that you brought along this evening as well. Um, but the piece I brought along here um, is a piece of Dutch Delftware. Um, Dutch Delftware, we obviously um, associate Delftware coming from Holland, the Netherlands. Uh, but in fact, uh, Delftware you can also describe as a collector's term. Um, Delftware is basically a pottery with a white glazed slip over the top. A uh, slip is like a liquid clay, a liquid porcelain. So we have a piece here that's dated 1680, 1690, comes from uh, the Netherlands. Um, so we're looking at Charles II's reign as far as uh, our period is concerned. Does anyone want to take a guess what this article might be worth? Just for a bit of fun. I won't drop it, but uh, I might hand it over in a minute. What do we think, sir? What, what do we think? What, what's the value? A couple of hundred pounds, okay? Anyone think a bit more than a couple of hundred? Uh, I'm not there. bidding. I'm not bidding. You're not bidding? Okay. Yes, it is a little bit damaged. There is a couple of little chips and there's a, a bit of a crack across it as well. But in saying that, if you was uh, 300 years or so plus old, then you might have a bit of damage yourself. So, yes, there is a bit of damage there. So, no, thank you for that. Oh, okay. But the point I was making yes. was, does that decrease the price? Okay. Well, no. I'm just uh, just putting it putting it across that yes, obviously damage will um, make a bit of a difference, okay. but for something. The only point oh, I was making. Thank you. Um, and from the 1680s period, um, does anyone want to else take a guess what it might be worth? Two thousand. Okay, two thousand pounds. Okay. So everyone's got a sort of various sort of indication of what it might be worth. I always like showing this one here. 
um, because it's basically something that in an auction sale environment mm. might only make sort of 50 or so pounds in that sort of area. Generally when we sell these type of pieces it really comes down to the demand uh, of the object uh, and on this occasion um, the demand for this particular piece wouldn't be particularly that strong. Now um, when you look at other aspects of Delfware, if we associate um, English Delfware, let's say we have King Charles II's portrait upon it, then the price really will dramatically increase anywhere between sort of, uh, for a Charles II's portrait upon it, 10, 50, even 20,000 pounds for such a piece. So it's always interesting that sometimes when I show people this, that they think that age uh, gives uh, an added value, but not all the time does age give added value. It comes down to demand of object. So something else I'm going to show you completely to the different scale uh, is uh, this little corgi toy here. Uh, this corgi toy, made in the 1970s, you can pick this up in Woolworths for about a pound or so. Um, but these days, demand for corgi, dinky, matchbox toys it is completely, you know, the market is so strong. Again, um, this is going to make more than the Dutch Delft charge of the 1680s period. Um, something like this in its original box and, and its condition as well, it might make maybe 150 to 200 pounds. Um, the demand is very strong for any TV related item, dinky corgi or matchbox. So, again, something like this, um, for me, Mass produced, but the market much more demand for this. Right at, at this stage, um, uh, there is quite a few items um, to be um, having a little value and uh, talk about. So, what I do, if it's okay with your good selves, is I'll um, hand on an object, speak to the owner, maybe get a bit of history behind uh, the actual object. Uh, we can talk about history, and then if the owner likes, uh, maybe a value as well. So, I'll pick the items up, and we'll just. Uh, talk about them as we go along. So the first uh, object which I'm picking up now is a pair of uh, bamboo vases. Who do, who do these ones belong to? So yours, madam, and how do we come by these? Came down through the family. They've been in the cupboard for about 45 years. Okay, so just no particular history, no. just in the family yeah, and, yeah. and now in the cupboard. Okay, well, first of all, um, we can see the material bamboo, known as spill vases, just decorative uh, vases. Um, Nothing particularly to be used, but they're quite nicely carved. Uh, we can see sort of flowers and foliage and a sort of a little figure in a little bit of junk boat. They probably date to the 1900 period, sort of 1900, 1910, as far as age is concerned. Um, commercially, not, not, a, not a vast sum of money. But these were, these were generally made out in China for, for sort of the Western market, really. Um, would you like to know a, a value? Yes. Okay, really value is not, again, not, as I said, not, not a great deal. Um, commercially, probably sort of 40 to 80 pounds um, in that type of area. Okay. Each. Uh, for the pet. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's a nice little piece. Who does that one belong to? That's yours as well. Sorry, yes. I like this piece. And tell me a bit more about the history behind this one. Again, just came just through. down to the family. The family now, yes. being the size it is, uh, one would say, oh, um, a page turner rather than a, a, a letter opener. Um, obviously, quite a large size, but a fantastic carving here. You probably can't appreciate what I've got in my hand here, ladies and gentlemen. Um, but basically, a page turner with a carved head of a sort of a little um, pug dog, bulldog, um, with um, glass eyes. Now this is very much a Victorian piece, 1870s, 1880s, um, and uh, quite collectible as well. Um, again, value, if you wish to know the value, between sort of 100 to 150 pounds. Um, very collectible, a very nice, interesting page turner. Now I'm just looking at the wood as well. Um, it was, it's a quite a nice grain walnut. It's a very nice carved piece of walnut, and for me, as I said, you can't appreciate it, but the, uh, the head of the dog there is particularly well carved. It's, a it's such a very nice piece, that one. So, <coughs> nice piece, thank you. I have a lovely shaped teapot here. What a great shape that is. Who does that one belong to? Your set, and any history behind this at all? It was presented to my father when he left the West Country to come and work in the city. Right, okay, well first of all, um, you can see that it is uh, a solid piece of silver. Always get a bit of confusion with uh, sort of identifying silver, um, but quite quickly, if we have a, a, a lion with a raised paw upon it, then it's called the lion passant mark, it's a sterling mark, um, so we know that the item is, is solid silver. We certainly have that with on, it, with on the piece. Uh, we also have um, a leopard's head um, with a crown upon it. This would indicate that it was made in London before 1820. Um, and then we have the date letter 
um, which I can't work out for you, but it is uh, a teapot certainly before the 1820s period made in London. <coughs> Good solid silver piece. Um, one would expect that a, a jug uh, and a little sugar pot would have gone with this, um, but you shake your head, unfortunately. Very nice piece um, and uh, desirable. The market for um, nice pieces of silver is, is very strong in, in the auction market. Um, would you like to know a value? Uh, value, um, present market conditions, um, somewhere between three to five hundred pounds, I think, for that one, sir. Excuse me, Mark. Yes. The price of silver is about six thousand dollars an ounce. Is there a correlation between price of silver and value? Um, generally, with, when you get to a certain stage with silver, it will come more down to the age and, and the and demand, and also who, who's made the object. Um, at the moment, as you're aware, silver is very strong on the market trade. Um, so yes, people will put articles uh, onto a scale and just weigh its silver content. If you were just to weigh the silver content of that, it's probably only about sort of 50 or 60 pounds. Um, so we're valuing it by the fact that it is Georgian silver, a good shape, and a good collectible item as well. <coughs> We have a little Dalton jug. Who does that one belong to? Your sir, and uh, any history behind this at all? Um, came down through my aunt, I think my grandparents originally, um, but I don't know how it, you know, how it came to be part of the family. Fair enough. Let's have a little bit. First of all, I think it's a fantastic piece of pottery. Um, it's got a sort of a very much a, an Art Nouveau influence to it when we talk about <coughs> Art Nouveau as a style, um, 1890s, 1900s. Um, and if we can flip it upside down, we'll certainly see um, some marks uh, relating to Dalton. Oh, there's a bit of water coming out of it. <laughs> been, been cleaned recently, sir? Uh, yes. That's okay. <laughs> um, we, we have uh, the Dalton mark, which is basically a, a, a lion uh, above a crown, and then it just says Royal Dalton. Um, so no potter's mark there that I'm familiar with, uh, but very much, as I said, of the last uh, 10 years of the 19th century. Um, just a nice decorative jug. Commercially, uh, the market for this type of Dalton isn't particularly um, that strong, but there is a little bit of flexibility there. Um, a value, sir, would you wish? Um, basically, we'd be looking at maybe between sort of 50 to 100 pounds for it in that type of area. Now, I won't pick the next item up because it does look quite heavy, and uh, it's but a very nice piece. Got a high Victorian mantel clock here with a classical maiden holding a, a pendulum there. Who does that one belong to? Yours, and how did we come by this one? Um, my father rescued it from um, uh, another relative who was going to chuck it out and keep the feet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> it's a mystery clock, so call it. Indeed. Um, first of all, um, just looking at this sort of age, very high Victoriana, we're looking at about 1880s, 1890s. Um, black slate mantel clock. Uh, the maiden who's actually holding the pendulum uh, is made of spelter rather than bronze, unfortunately. Yeah. Um, we would uh, to look at sort of quality pieces. If it was bronze, then uh, commercially the, the price would be um, a lot stronger. Um, to the back, generally um, looking, uh, I haven't looked, but I'm going to presume that there's a French movement um, yeah. to, the, to the back, so that they have like a little circular movement uh, rather yeah. than a square movement. Um, also, as well, we have uh, two key winds, uh, two key winds to the dial, uh, which basically means that wind it up nicely should go for eight days or a little bit longer. Uh, good quality piece. Now, um, fashion trends for clocks, mantel clocks, they've got to be something a little bit more uh, unusual, special, and I do think that this is a little bit more unusual, and a little bit more special. Now, um, I haven't looked at the back to see if there's any maker's name to the back of the movement at all. Um, but I will have a look later on for you. Let's say it's just a standard French maker, um, value-wise, if you wish. Um, the, the, the value, I would say, somewhere between three to five hundred pounds in that type of area. But if you've got a, a maker's name that's a little bit more desirable, then obviously we'd be able to push the price up if it was to ever go onto the market. Right, um, move on. Uh, we'll look at the back here, and uh, we've got this uh, very much of a brightly coloured lustre bowl. Uh, who does that one belong to? Uh, sure, sir. And again, any history behind this at all? Another inheritance piece. <laughs> okay. Um, first of all, we've got this very sort of highly uh, lustred glaze. 
um, which one associates uh, very much to the 1920s, 1930s type of style, the Art Deco period. Um, we look underneath uh, and we have uh, Royal Venton where, um, which was uh, generally making into the Burslem uh, area. We also have a little signature there which I can't identify, it looks like Holcroft, not a, uh, an artist I'm personally familiar with. Um, however, my eye has spotted quite a bit of damage to, to the side, unfortunately. Um, been sort of uh, been put back and restored with um, some very technical uh, yoo-hoo or, or some glue or something along <laughs> those, those sorts. Not, not my bit, not my bit. But um, yes, nice bowl. Um, I don't think it's going to be much of a, a value, but very much of an Art Deco period. If it was in perfect condition, maybe 50 to 80 pounds or so, but the damage, unfortunately, uh, is going to hold it back, back on a market value. Uh, what else have we got? Uh, little wedge with uh, clock there. Who does that one belong to? Yeah. Yours, sir? Uh, yeah. Any sort of uh, history behind this at all? Uh, only that um, my late father-in-law um, lived in Cape, Cape and Stoke on Trent, Etruria, I think, and his father worked uh, for Wedgwoods, mm. and wow. it's through him that that, that that came down the front. Yeah, I think it's less. Mm. Well, it's quite quite an interesting piece. Uh, Quite clearly, uh, to the uh, to the base, we have the impressed mark of Wedgwood, um, which is very good. Um, let's have a little look at the back. Sometimes there's a mark at the back as well, mm. which is not. Right, this type of um, Wedgwood, um, known as Jasperware. Um, Jasperware um, was made in seven various colours, uh, including the more popular, which is this um, sort of dark royal blue. Um, now, the actual piece itself, um, I always find that Wedgwood Jasperware is so underrated and so undervalued. The reason behind it, the classical figures, um, what we class the sprigging, which is this raised decoration to the side and also to the base, is generally cast and moulded out by hand and then placed onto the pottery. Um, so, for an artist, uh, um, someone of very good technical ability to do that, very labour intensive to do, very expensive to do, um, but in today's market, the desirability isn't particularly as strong as what I feel it should be. Uh, the Americans uh, like to buy Wedgwood, um, and this piece here being a clock, which is more unusual, clocks don't often come on uh, to the market. Um, it's certainly a piece which I think uh, could have a reasonable um, uh, price to it. I'm just having a look to see if there's a little maker's name to the dial there. Not a maker I'm familiar with as far as the movement's concerned. Uh, would you like to know a price, sir? Yes. Um, Price-wise, I think, again, if this were to be placed into a, a realistic auction sale, um, you're probably looking at a, a ballpark figure somewhere between two to three hundred pounds, maybe a bit more if the, the internet or two people really like it, it might go up a little bit, but I wouldn't see it passing about three hundred pounds or so. But a nice club. <coughs> We've got a little uh, dressing table set here, which um, comprises two perfume bottles, some brushes, uh, and a little uh, trinket box there as well. Um, you can speak to the lady earlier on. Where's she gone? And the history behind it, you bought it about 30 years ago? Yeah, about 32 years ago, on a rainy day in Cornwall. Okay. Mm -hmm. Saw it in an antique shop and thought, oh, is this a good investment? Right, so no. 32 years ago, no. down in Cornwall, <laughs> is this a good investment? No. Wow, I don't know how much on the hearts we paid for it. Um, but let, 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 let's talk about the article first and, and then we'll talk about uh, monetary values. Um, so first of all, um, we've got this dressing table set which has a hand mirror, two brushes, uh, a little ashtray there as well by the looks. Um, quite a nice individual little piece. Now first of all, looking at the quality of the work, um, this is just gilt metal, it's not, not precious metal unfortunately. Um, we do have... Um, little sewing uh, panels uh, to the tops of, of all the pieces and um, again you probably can't appreciate what I'm showing you ladies and gentlemen but there is uh, sort of a hand sewn uh, needlework uh, embroidered to the to the stopper there we have the glass stoppers there as well so quite pretty um, dating it I would probably date this to the Edwardian 1920s period 1915 1920 around that sort of age um, commercially today in an auction sale, um, I may be going to be disappointing you as far as price is concerned. Um, we will probably estimate that no more than about sort of 50 to 80 pounds. So hopefully that it wasn't too much back in 32 years ago. 
Simulated uh, outside box, um, sort of gold barred gold relief as well. Um, into the centre, uh, the actual inset itself, um, velvet. So one would imagine this is a little trinket box, something along those sort of lines. Now, um, dating it is quite interesting because it has a, a, a patent uh, applied for, um, but we also have a Victorian uh, lodging mark, um, and it actually it does have a date on there, which is. About 18, is it 1889? Eight, yeah, eight, it looks like 19th of May 1889. So, first of all, when I picked this up, I, I was going to say that this is very much sort of an Art Deco piece, 1920s, 30s. It, it's got that sort of ilk of it. But very surprisingly, um, we have that date upon it. Collectability wise, um, desirable as far as commercial aspects. Uh, I, I don't think we've got a lottery win here this evening, unfortunately. Um, value, if I was to place a value upon it, maybe sort of £50 in that type of area. I don't think I would have paid Right, ladies and gentlemen, um, I believe I've um, valued the item. I've got something I've got about, which is this uh, Lowry picture, which I spoke to the gentleman earlier on. Right, a Lowry print. Where's the gentleman? There he is. Um, the history behind it at all, sir? Yeah, my mother bought it from students who were at the Manchester University. Lowry signed a number and let the uh, students sell them to make some income. Um, and that is how we, we came across it. it. It is signed, as you can see. Signed uh, to, the, to the lower there uh, in, in pencil. Now, these uh, prints were done limited edition wise uh, in either ones between 1 to 500, 1 to 1,000. But I had a look earlier on. And they didn't actually say um, what particularly, if it was an actual limited edition. I can't see that to the front. Um, I know you've probably done a little bit of research yourself, but these are generally sort of limited edition pieces, 1 to 500, 1 to 1500, in that type of area. Um, I also commented on the fact that um, generally these type of prints would have a little bit more vibrant colour to them. Um, now, on this occasion, the colour seems to, I don't know, just disappeared whether the sun has got to it at some stage. I or that myself, but if that had happened, the rest of it would have actually faded as well. If you look, the areas where the colour should be, mm. which is the train and also on the right hand side, they're fairly well printed, so I can only <coughs> assume it was a printing port. Yeah, that's the other sort of uh, side of the coin I was going to probably that's comment on, but um, it's, it's been under glass, for that would protect it as well, so I, I do agree with you on that side. Now, commercially with these type of Lowry prints, um, they always sell reasonably well. Obviously, nowhere near as much a, as, as an original. Um, generally, um, prints of this type of ilk um, will sell for anywhere between four to six hundred pounds. I have sold them um, in uh, in better colour um, for over a thousand. Um, but I think for this one, um, I would suggest that the you have a, a, a print here that has a, a, a realistic value between three to five, four to six hundred in that type of area. But yeah, very <coughs> nice print. Thank you. Um, ladies and gentlemen, before I, I finish up this evening, um, I'm very happy to take uh, any questions mate, you might have um, about the antique industry, about my job in Pacific, or any items that you might have at home, so I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Quite a few hands going up. Well, <laughs> We've got a, we've got a piece here if you'd like. Okay, well, and what I can do is I'll probably finish up my talk and then I can have a chat with uh, you individually um, after, on, after, the, uh, uh, after the presentation. So I'll take a, a question, thank you. A good investment for the future. A good investment for your future. Where's that crystal ball? Um, I think that the way um, the market is, I wouldn't say uh, antiques are a particularly 
great investment. I think something that you could probably use for your home. They are, at the moment, quite cheap. Antiques are, are cheap. Um, let's talk about a chest of drawers, Victorian chest of drawers, 1890s solid mahogany. You can pick them up for £150, maybe £200 for a good solid chest of drawers. Um, so antiques I would probably stay away from. The art market goes up and down like the stock market. So you've got to be probably looking something a little bit more like autographs, um, somewhere where a famous person, um, how can I be a little bit, uh, a famous person that probably has not much longer to live um, is always a, a good sort of way to go as far as investment is concerned. Um, so that, that's always good. Anytime I had a, when Michael Jackson passed away, the, the autographs literally shot, shot up in value when he, when he passed away. So. Um, that's uh, something to look out for. Autographs, um, film memorabilia, um, good films uh, that have gone by recently um, over a few years, Titanic memorabilia, that sort of thing. So good films related to those, um, not just uh, the memorabilia, but item film posters. If you can get into the cinema and ask for the film poster or for the lobby card, along those sort of lines. Um, toys, toys are still doing very well. So. Maybe buy a toy for uh, a, a, as a gift, but buy another one to keep to one side. Um, but difficult to say what is going to be hot property for, for the future. But um, that's my little pun on that, is probably buying a, a few toys and maybe some film memorabilia. Oh, thank you. Okay. Uh, I've got a couple of postcards which were posted from the Berlin Olympics in 1936. And there's a couple also with Hitler uh, photographed on the postcards. Are they valuable at all? I would imagine they would be. Um, a little bit out of my range of knowledge, but um, yes, I think there's going to be collectability there um, and value. Um, but um, if you wish to, um, I, I could probably find a consultant that would uh, uh, advise you a bit more than I could on those. Um, but yes, I, I, I think there's a bit of value there. Okay. Is there any value of Mr. Nehru's autographs, 1959, 57? Again, a little bit out of my range of knowledge. Yes, I think there certainly would be, um, but how much I, 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 I couldn't comment on. And same Indira Gandhi's autograph, 1959. Very much. Uh, I think, think there could be a certain bit of interest there. Most definitely. Well, ladies and gentlemen, um, as it's uh, getting up to time, um, I will say thank you very much uh, for a lovely meal. Thank you for good company. Um, and uh, thank you for listening and uh, maybe I'll attend in the near future. Thank you very much. Before we me to give a vote of thanks, uh, first of all, one question, one question which intrigues me is, uh, is your house full of antiques? Um, a few, um, but not, not many. No, so it's not actually loaded. Mm. Have you had them valued? <laughs> 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 On a daily basis, yes. <laughs> well, Mark, thanks very much indeed for coming on a second time to um, uh, outline your profession to us. It's, it's not just a profession, it's obviously a labour of love, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, and your knowledge is outstanding. And I'd like our fellows to uh, welcome you uh, to show their appreciation in the usual way. With a big round of applause. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the end of the formal part of the evening. Um...